Hello, everyone, and welcome to the film screening and panel discussion of Undetectable, How Stigma Has Gone Viral in the Fight Against HIV, a TELUS original documentary. My name is Leah Kamzen, and I have the distinct pleasure of leading the TELUS original program and a small but exceptional team of production executives, including Christina Willings, who worked on this excellent film. I'm joining this event from the traditional territories of the Coast Salish peoples, the Squamish, tsleil Musqueam nations, where I have the opportunity to live and work. Talus's work spans many Indigenous territories and treaty areas. I also acknowledge the Indigenous territories and lands from which you are joining us today. Talus Originals is a film funding program that supports the production of high impact social purpose documentaries and docu-series that reflect the kaleidoscopic Canadian experience. We have the pleasure of working closely with established and award-winning filmmakers such as Laura O'Grady, who I will introduce in just a moment. Importantly, a big thank you to everyone watching who is a Telus Optic TV customer. With your support, since 2017, the TELUS Originals program has provided $14 million to funding to BC and Alberta-based filmmakers, which has led to the production of over 220 documentaries about people and places in your communities. We are proud to present the film, Undetectable, to you today and host an amazing panel of local and global leaders for what I'm sure will be an excellent dialogue. Now, I'm honored to introduce Laura O'Grady, the director of Undetectable. Laura is a multi-award winning, 20 plus year veteran of the broadcast industry. Her documentaries have debuted at, at Toronto's Hot Docs International Documentary Film Festival. They've won or been nominated for multiple provincial and national awards and found audiences truly around the world. Laura is currently in production on a new TELUS original documentary that follows a frontline worker who has big dreams of drag show superstardom. Laura, thank you for sharing the story with us and for entrusting our team to support the production. Over to you to introduce the film. Thank you, Leah. And thank you to everyone who's joining us for the screening today of Undetectable, how stigma has gone viral in the fight against HIV. I came to this idea about four years ago when I was interviewing a young gay man who was working at a risk reduction clinic. He said he wanted to give back to his community because when he was growing up, he never heard of AIDS nor the HIV virus. And I was shocked that this tragic history could be so quickly forgotten, nor the advancements be widely known. I'm very grateful that TELUS Originals supported this film from the very beginning, as we documented the remarkable advancements that have been made by the BC Center for Excellence in HIV AIDS and the lives of the on the ground warriors like Tico Kerr, Mark Randall and Carrie Gulkey. I hope you enjoy this film, but also question why we're not why we're we're still seeing rising HIV infection rates despite proven strategies like treatment as prevention. I hope you can stay for our panel afterwards with Dr. Julio Montaner, Tico Kerr, and Carrie Gulkey. I also want to dedicate this screening to a character in the film, Johnny, who since passed uh, due to addiction issues. Um, and uh, we're very grateful that he appeared in this film and uh, was successfully being treated by the STOP team. We will now move on into the screening of Undetectable. The test came back positive. The doctor came in and threw my file down on the desk and said, well, you might as well just go home and get your things in order. I've been taking a lot of medication over the years and accumulating a lot of bottles. So rather than turning it into landfill, I thought I'd um, turn it into art. This has become one of the new media of uh, my practice. When I was first diagnosed with HIV, it was a death sentence. The infecting HIV virus attached to the cells in my immune system, causing them to recreate the virus's genetic material. 
I knew that as HIV infected more cells, AIDS would inevitably appear as I would no longer be able to defend my body from infections. Then new drugs were developed and they suppressed the virus in my blood. I'm now able to live a long and healthy life. I'm considered to be undetectable. It's impossible for me now to transmit HIV to anyone else. This is the miracle that we've all been waiting for. We know how to end HIV AIDS. We finally have the way. We just don't have the will to get there. Made the right decision to fight AIDS and now to create a generation free of it. We dare not walk away. There is a generation in jeopardy. But we have reason to have hope. Reason to believe that we can, in fact, reach our goal of ending AIDS by 2030. 90% of the people tested, 90% of those people on treatment, and 90% with uh, undetectable uh, viral load. We can end this pandemic. We can beat this disease. We can win this fight. This should be an AIDS-free world. We don't need a cure. We don't need to wait for a vaccine. We could decrease the burden of HIV AIDS globally by greater than 90% during our lifetime with nothing much more than we were already have. And we're not going to do this because we don't want to. I approach my work in a format that's very much like a record keeper. I think it's important to describe the times that I'm living in. Well, I don't think there's a, a more chilling word to the human um, vocabulary than plague. It usually comes at a time where we have no idea where it's coming from. No idea how it's transmitted. But what's interesting is how a plethora of misinformation and myths and blaming that um, seem to be really endemic to the human experience. We're very much like walking collages. We have a little bit of an understanding of politics and of, of ethics and all these portions that we carry that we think we understand are always changing. I think that's really responsible for why we have challenges in understanding one another. I quickly learned that if anyone thought you were or you were associated with someone living with HIV, you were very quickly ostracized and being spoken about. The secret to making a good biscuit is to not overwork your dough. If you work it too much, it gets tough. And follow the recipe. Now, was that two or was that three? We're gonna hope it was three. My original career was as a journeyman baker, so this was where I started my world. Anytime I make these and people have them, they go, oh my God, these remind me of my grandma's biscuits. And so anything that makes you think of home and family can't be bad. I got my HIV status given to me at Foothills Hospital in a little tiny room by Dr. John Gill. And he basically said, we've got your test results back. They've come back positive. And my response was, yay, great. And that was my lesson in medical practice, that positive in medical terms is not a good thing. And my only question for him was, how, how long? <laughs> because that was the reality, how long? And he wrote on the blackboard, three to five years. There was amazing confusion when the epidemic first arrived. This disease is going to be with us for many, many years and decades into the future. 
the situation will only get worse in the foreseeable future. Perhaps in five or ten years' time, if we have a vaccine, then the situation might start to improve. But this virus is with us, and it's going to stay with us for many years to come. Fear was rampant. What we knew about HIV was limited. In three years, nearly 2,000 of us will be dead. But if not stopped, it could kill more than World War II. I went to what's called an ICAC conference, which is a huge American uh, uh, infectious disease conference. And there were four presentations in a row by world's leading experts. One mapped where new AIDS cases were being seen with petrochemical pollution. The next speaker got up and said, no, no, no. It's related to sexual stimulants that damage the immunity. The next chap came up from Paris and said, look at this strange fungus that we're finding in patients with AIDS blood. We think that there could be something in the water supply of these big cities that's grown because of climate change that's proliferating and causing immune suppression in certain communities. Confusion and a lot of fear because it was quickly recognized this was a very, very serious and fatal medical condition. Before it was renamed AIDS, it was called GRID, which is gay-related immunodeficiency. So right from the beginning, there was this association with AIDS uh, with gay men. When you're dealing with a new syndrome like that and you don't really understand it, a lot of the misunderstanding, not only regarding AIDS in general, but regarding the entire homosexual population and how they may have been uh, uh, the early victims of this particular disease. And as There didn't seem to be this sense that HIV was something that was going to become global and affect millions of people. And I think that really stymied a lot of the early research and certainly the support for people living with HIV and AIDS. I had a patient in the 90s before there was effective treatment. So one day I get a phone call from his mother. Dr. Montana, I wanted to share with you some good news. I said, yeah, what, what is it? My son died. <laughs> but he didn't die from AIDS. He had an accident. And, and I was, to me, that was an incredible realization. The family was happy because he, was, he didn't die from AIDS. But he died 40 years ahead of time. But that's to show you the powerful stigma when it was all, it was all so frustrating for me. The way media covered HIV and AIDS, it, it definitely had a homophobic tone to it. The major problem in the world today is not AIDS, but homosexuals and homosexual travel. We've got to close the borders to homosexuals. I just remember God's wrath on homosexuals and statements of this is this is what you get for the lifestyle you've chosen to live. There are uh, all forms of stigma, discrimination, uh, uh, prejudice uh, that affects our work. We were always getting beaten up. We were always getting bashed. It was, it was um, um, a really a dangerous time. The news that Rock Hudson, in fact, has AIDS generated new interest in that deadly disease today and, no doubt, new fears. British rock star Freddie Mercury died Sunday of complications from AIDS. This is an epidemic. This is the Black Plague of the 1980s. And you think it could never happen to you? Whether it's a drug addict, or an alcoholic or someone who's living promiscuously as far as his or her moral life is concerned, uh, we pay the price when we violate the laws of God. This was the cusp of the wave of social unrest from disinformation. The Soviet Union decided that it would 
spread disinformation in the West regarding AIDS. And the idea was to spread rumors that this could be a virus engineered by the CIA. It was customized to affect only gay men or Africans, that the treatments didn't work. For those of us in the field at the time, we remember, this just doesn't ring true. All the characteristics and the credible science suggests this is not correct. My children, uh, who are currently in their 30s, uh, so they were born in, their, in the 80s, in grade school, uh, uh, coming home and, and sharing with me the fact that they were being asked by others, teachers or whoever, why is your father doing this work? This painting was when I was at my worst. I just come out of the hospital and I was fighting for my life and trying to get drugs from Health Canada. Uh, it wasn't going that well, it wasn't very encouraging, and so the working title for this painting is um, My Government is Trying to Kill Me. We were fueled by a lot of anger and hatred for um, just being um, disposable. I absolutely believe that um, being an artist and activist are hopefully um, the same thing. One feeds the other, feeds the other, feeds the other. In the early days of the HIV epidemic, gay men were the community that were very hard hit by HIV, by AIDS, and they were the initial community that responded, demanding attention for this virus. There was a real sense that governments had failed us, the healthcare system had failed us, and so we needed to get out there and, uh, and, and make noise. Today's demonstration is the latest of many staged by the militant group ACT UP, which has gained increasing influence on AIDS policy. ACT UP started in the United States, in New York, and then it spread to other cities, and it actually went global. And it stood for AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power, and it really was a direct action volunteer run, we're going to challenge governments, we're going to do die-ins, we're going to do sit-ins, we're going to sit in government offices until we can actually speak to someone who's going to make some change. I am so sick of hearing about our tactics offending people. Uh, the Vietnam War was not ended by people being nice. Uh, nice people walk into gas chambers. <laughs> Constructively use community engagement and activism can be very helpful. HIV does not make people dangerous to know. So you can shake their hands and give them a hug. Heaven knows they need it. It helps focus researchers. It helps focus politicians on the need for what is felt by many people to be important. The first candidate drug for the treatment of HIV emerged. The company looked around the world, various places, to, to, to place the drug for clinical trials. In Canada, St. Paul's was the natural place to go. And the West End uh, was the heart of the epidemic at the beginning of the epidemic. In the early days, uh, St. Paul's was one of the first hospitals to consider treating people with HIV. Well, in the beginning, no other hospitals would take people with HIV. So they were all sent from Lionsgate in uh, West Vancouver, North Vancouver, uh, from the general. They weren't interested in uh, people with HIV, so um, St. Paul's took it on. You'd go into uh, the clinic and you'd see so many people that you knew in various stages of dying. Some that you could tell they weren't going to be there next week or some that were newly diagnosed that were terrified and trying to swallow that. But through it all, um, it was really, really difficult to be surrounded and be reminded of uh, the progression of the disease, but it also created a solidarity. We were sheltered from stigma there, but there was a lot of self-stigma too. 
self-loathing and so on that we carried with us. AZT came out 86, 87. I had a lot of friends that had a very hard time with uh, AZT. And because of that, they stopped doing uh, Western medicine, unfortunately. AZT being the first um, truly broadly used medication at the time um, had profound side effects for me. Dizziness, nausea, wicked headaches, vertigo. Almost lost my hand in a mixer at work one day, and that was the defining, I'm done with this drug thing. Like, the diarrhea and the headaches were, were already enough of a debilitation, but I, I told John, my, my doctor, I told him flat out, I says, I felt fine until you gave me this to take, and I'm not gonna take this. At the time, we're faced with the dilemma. Can I tolerate taking these drugs that give me diarrhea, or do I not take them and die? It was grim. I mean, you see someone 23 and you tell them they're going to be dead in six months. That's tough. Even if it was winning a battle of stopping someone going blind, that's a win. If you can't fix the underlying problem, but you can keep them with vision for six months, celebrate that. We scored lots of little things where, you know, we kept people alive so their family could visit. We kept them in housing where they were happy and could die with dignity. Those were little wins, and we scored a lot of little wins, although we knew we were losing the bigger battle. Eventually, uh, you have to go through all your assets. Um, and like I said, it wasn't hard to get rid of all of those things knowing that there wasn't anything being offered as a future. When I was told I was going to be dead in three to five years, I cashed in my insurance policies and everything because that was the advice we were all being given to do because it wasn't going to go anywhere anyway. Eventually, I couldn't work anymore, so I lost my job and savings are gone. Yeah, there was, uh, there was a lot of uh, financial damage. The reel to reel belongs to my husband, and the records all belong to my husband as well. I used to have a collection of records, but I got rid of those when um, I was making my final arrangements and planning my goodbye, and as I was told to do. So now I get to listen to all my husband's records instead. And, and he's got a very eclectic collection of records. He grew up with the early country folks, and I did not. <laughs> we had a problem with people who had developed intolerance or side effects to the medication, so we needed to develop new strategies because just having two treatments alone uh, was not, not enough variety to ensure that you, 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 and you uh, would have your needs met. perception was that these drugs were toxic, uh, didn't derive enough benefit, and blah, blah, blah. Uh, the reality is, yes, all that was true, but, you know, you had to start somewhere. By the end of the year, in 1995, we knew we have a breakthrough. It really contributed to defining the new standard of care that became highly active antiretroviral therapy, or the triple drug cocktail. I got a phone call from the clinic saying, hey, this, we've got this new clinical trial drug. It was right after the, um, um, the Vancouver AIDS conference had happened. So um, I got a phone call from the clinic um, asking if I was interested. I said, absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm being told to plan my end. I think I started taking medications in September. My mother had come out that summer um, and had seen me at my worst. By November, I called my mother and I told her I weighed 176 pounds. It was profound. Um, I was walking my dog. I was shoveling my sidewalk. I was able to climb my stairs and use my bathroom upstairs for the first time in a year. She said she wouldn't believe me till she saw me. Um, so when I flew home in December, I walked right past her in the airport and she didn't even see me.
She was looking for the kid she saw in September. And didn't even recognize the son she saw in November. So I turned around in the airport and said, what? I gained a few pounds, you don't even recognize me. And uh, she just, she just, she just cried. She just cried. The term miracle was being used. Um, I'm not a faith guy. Um, science miracle, whatever. Whatever, don't care. It worked. It worked and it opened the door to, to newer, better, greater medications, um, took death away, took fear away, took anxiety away, put hope on the table. People who are on effective treatment have a lowered amount of virus in their blood. Undetectable simply means that the amount of virus is so low because it's of the effectiveness of the treatment that it cannot be detected. You take a pill every day and it basically like kills all the copies of the virus in your blood and um, that means that you can achieve and maintain an undetectable viral load. I know that my treatment works, that I'm now, my virus is at a level that's undetectable. And because my virus is undetectable, I'm not transmitting HIV. I cannot transmit HIV. Living in the, the shame of um, perhaps infecting someone else is a huge part of um, this, this self-stigma that I used to st deal with. Being undetectable not only gives you uh, your life back, but it makes you feel um, part of the community again. And this message is just now starting to be heard, and it's been true for four years. Um, and it needs to be screamed from the rooftops. And it, it's not. You equals you is based on tens of thousands of um, instances where someone is living with HIV and someone is not living with HIV and the virus has not been transmitted. We've interviewed many people, both living with HIV and HIV negative, about their understandings of undetectability. And many expressed a kind of resistance. This is what I've talked about as a too good to be trueness of the idea. How could you really equals you? Bruce Richmond is an HIV activist who probably started about four or five years ago looking at the science behind U equals U. And he faced many of the same hurdles that were faced in the early years where public health officials were like, we can't share this information with people. We can't trust them to, to use this information in the appropriate way. And he actually galvanized people all over the world to force governments to actually say, look, this is the science. Heads of clinics and medical associations would say, we don't want, we know this. We agree with the science 100%. And on an individual level, in our clinics, we will share this information, but on a public health level, this could be dangerous. There are those that will be listening to this going, they agree with that. Right, um, and that's based in 35 years of fear of, of the, uh, HIV and of people living with HIV. There is a window of opportunity before us, a window through which we can very clearly see the end of AIDS within my lifetime. We cannot afford to let the window close. Amen. If our efforts flag, drug resistance will surface, mm -hmm. transmission rates will rise, and this disease, which knows no boundaries, will once again become a ruthless pandemic with disastrous and far-reaching consequences. Having been exposed to so much suffering, death, transmission, etc., cetera, uh, stigma and discrimination, people with HIV, and knowing that I can stop all of this uh, and not happening, it was very painful. We begin with a major medical study that could be a game changer in the global fight against HIV. It finds that drug treatment alone may be the best defense to stop the spread of the virus. The findings are published in the medical journal The Lancet, 
and it could have huge implications around the world. Basically, uh, we had found that if you were to take uh, everybody infected with HIV and then offer them treatment in a way that it would be sustainable, you could eliminate AIDS, you could eliminate premature death related to HIV AIDS, and secondarily, for no additional investment, you could actually stop HIV transmission altogether. Treatment as prevention often is talked about just in relation to anti-HIV medication, but really I think it's important to think about it in the broader sense, testing um, access to antiretrovirals and the ability to maintain access to those antiretrovirals uh, and reach an undetectable viral load. Treatment as prevention, I do want to say a word about. Julio has been talking about this for a very long period of time. Now we have absolute confirmed data that he was right all along. Treatment is prevention. What is lacking is the political predisposition to get it done. And we see this vast array of humankind unnecessarily suffering that you could stop it. Why in God's name wouldn't you throw your life into it? Seek and Treat aims to decrease HIV disease. There is a large segment of the at-risk population who are not at all connected to the health system. Through Seek and Treat, we are going to actually support and provide antiretroviral therapy to those people wherever possible. I work for Vancouver Coco Health for the STOP team. And STOP, some people say Seek and Treat, I like to say Support and Treat for optimal prevention. Oh, hi, it's Carrie calling from the STOP team. Just done working with Jake, and he's anxious to start his ARVs. Have they arrived yet? We have outreach workers, we have outreach nurses, and outreach social workers. This outreach program works. I mean, the, the biggest piece is the relationship building. I've left the message. You're, you're supposed to start this week. We've got a good team of people that there's no judgment, and there's what you call unconditional support. Thank you. OK, see you soon. connect people to services, to doctors, and ideally we get them on antiretroviral medication. But we don't always. The idea is to support them where they're at. In this job, you do see so much injustice, so much inequity. People are criminalized for having a substance use disorder. The stigma, the shame that you see. I had one client who refused to go on, on antiretrovirals virals right until the end. She called me and said, I'm gonna go on the meds, don't get too excited, Carrie. So I said I would phone her every day to remind her. A few weeks later, I discovered she wasn't taking them. And I said, why am I phoning you every day? And she goes, oh yeah, sorry about that. I visited her, supported her in her death, told her I loved her. Being with her at the end was as much for me as it was for her. I feel like I am making a positive difference in people's lives, even if it's just having a relationship. And I feel really privileged that people let me into their lives. They just said you're on the wait list. Oh, really? Yeah. That's good. Did okay. you stay there last night? Oh, I haven't stayed there in two days. Where have you been staying? Uh, nowhere. Nowhere. <laughs> Especially when someone's homeless, then they don't get their meds regularly. And that's a big thing with antiretrovirals is adherence. You have to be taking them regularly. So it's actually more crucial to connect with people when they're homeless. Do you have any recent photographs of Christian? In August, he'll be one, right? Uh, Let's see. Oh, I don't think I have seen this one. He looks great. Michelle had a baby about a year ago. Kind of helped her through that, made sure she was on her uh, meds and got methadone and got good care while she was pregnant. So the baby's born all right, like he hasn't got HIV. I think it would be great if you went up um, and saw your dad and, you, and Christian. So we can help with that. All right, see you next week. The first thing people want to know is like, well, how did you get it? As if the mechanism of acquiring HIV 
gives people a license to decide whether they need to care for you or, or whether you, you're to blame or, or, or sort of where to place that blame. A lot of people are surprised to know that more than half, about 52% of all people living with HIV around the world are women. The global face of HIV is a woman's face. So we can call the treatment center? Yeah. Our team has been working with Sienna since October of 2018. Um, she came to us after she moved here from Saskatchewan. She came to be with her partner at that time. Try to tell your partner you're sick and then it go, he goes and spreads it around like, and leaves you. And you're just trying to be clean about it, right? He, he was the one that gave it to me. We were together since we were young, right? Mm -hmm. And then he just passed away in the 2015 of HIV. We see that Indigenous women have the highest death rate in Canada uh, with HIV. They're last to go on to the medications. According to Health Canada, Saskatchewan reserves have an HIV rate 11 times the national rate. Those are incident rates that are equivalent to an African country uh, such as Nigeria. One of the challenges that we face, particularly for people who may live in smaller or more remote communities, they may not have the same access to HIV testing. HIV has no boundaries, and people need to realize that it has no barriers between cultures or wealth or where you live. Anyone can get it. We have to talk about sex, and we have to talk about homophobia, and we have to start, we have to address things like sex work laws in different countries or different settings. We have to talk about harm reduction policies. Those are the spaces um, where, you know, we, we, have to, we have to push for progress, but we all live in the societies um, that, that, you know, the society, cultural norms, expectations, we all live in that soup. And the ARVs are how, how are you feeling being on your ARVs? Well, I'm glad that I'm back on them because yeah. it does help me in my blood work and yeah. Yeah. makes you feel a lot as sick as they normally would. Yeah. How are you feeling in general after being on them? I'm feeling good about it. Yeah. You mentioned you bumped into your sister the other day. Yeah, I haven't seen my sister in six months and she was really worried about me because she didn't know where I was. So she's happy that I'm still alive. Yeah, I bet. What's keeping you on the, the meds this time? What's helping? My family and and stuff, because I know how it would hurt them if I wasn't on them. I want to be there for my nephews and nieces, so. Oh, you're an uncle. So I, I got to be really careful of what I'm doing. I'm slowly thinking about going to recovery again, but not right now. Yeah. I'm not ready yet. Well, we're here to help when you're ready. <laughs> so over time, you get to know people really well and they get to know you. There becomes a level of trust. I feel like it's easier to say, well, hey, how about being on your meds? Or how can we support you with being on your meds? We really need to be flexible in our response. But the bottom line is everybody deserves to have access to treatment if they want to have it. That's awesome that we got blood work today. We yeah. should get the results back. Yeah, Hopefully by... Good. Yeah, I think it will be. You've been on your meds. Access to testing, access to HIV medication if you're living with HIV, access to HIV medication if you're at risk for HIV for prevention is not equally available in Canada. This should be a national disgrace. Any kind of change in government usually stops funding, usually stops understanding. The model that's been exhibited in Vancouver with um, treatment as pre prevention um, is universally accepted globally. But as you say, um, it's, it's not being enacted uh, nationally to any degree. If you look at the investments that have been made uh, uh, to support uh, HIV campaigns around the world, uh, things were coming along reasonably well up to 2008, uh, but when the recession hit, the global communities found a very reasonable excuse to say, oh, sorry, we can't, we can't continue to invest at the same rate. The money dried up and never came back. The value of antiretroviral therapy economically is it keeps someone healthy. 
It stops them transmitting HIV to other people that would incur extra costs. It keeps them in the workforce paying tax. So the economic argument to keep people healthy is very compelling. It's been tough. It continues to be tough. Uh, institutional leaders will tell you how much and they support us, how proud they are of our work. I beg to differ. I'm bitter about it. Uh, it's been a tough going, and um, I'm, 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 I'm not going to give up. Okay, let's do this. I'll pop that up just a little bit more for me. I have to take seven tubes worth of blood. Okay. If they're not down with something, they don't want to do blood work, they don't want to get their wound care this day, that's fine. Like, I just keep showing up. And until they're ready for me, that's when I do what I've been trained to do. I, I just love the people down here. It's it's kind of like the forgotten souls like that everybody leaves behind. And I just don't want to leave any of them behind. I want people to feel like somebody cares about them. I do have a first cousin and she is addicted. She lives over in the Abbotsford Ten City and I just hope that there's somebody like me looking after her. And uh, I'll, we'll see you next week for results. Uh, I know that we're on the right track, and I know that uh, this is what needs to be done. A lot of courage and dedication to fight the fights that need to be fought in order to get these programs up and running. Hey, Jim. He's here. This is Yasmin. She's a nurse on our team. Uh, I was hoping you could show her your wrists first. Now do you want to see the worst part? Sure. The way I get treated and probably everywhere I go to do with HIV or addiction, when I have Terry with me, it makes everything just go so much nicer. I think it's the difference between feeling like a, a junkie and feeling like a person. So are you okay if I send him a couple of those photos? We should celebrate the fact that we have a strategy to go forward to conquer the single most important public health threat of our generation, it could be a lot easier if people actually uh, were uh, following their moral compass. Here's my dad and me. My dad. Sitting in front of our nice little motor home that we used to use to go for our Christmas vacation every year. There's me and my mom on our sailboat. And that's my daughter. Those of you out there who, who think people living with HIV are a threat, we're not. Those of you who are living with HIV who are scared to take treatment, get off that fear. It's take treatment, it works. Um, you can live well, you can live happy. I never dreamed I would be going back to work full time. I never dreamed I would have a partner who I would marry. I never dreamed I would have the life I have today. I stopped dreaming. Um, but that all changed, and, and the world is different. I didn't think when we first met we'd ever get where we are now. No. You wrote three to five. <laughs> I was optimistic as well. It was optimistic. <laughs> you were very clear about that, five being very optimistic. I think we both should congratulate ourselves. I don't know if you know, but we're moving to injectables. The trouble with the injectables is they give you a sore backside for a few days, but you don't have to take any pills. It lasts up to one to two months, which is good. This has gone from a disease that was absolutely terrifying. We knew very little about it. It was taking down co entire communities to now me saying that you can live a normal lifespan and you can have babies and have great, enjoyable, pleasurable sex and you don't have to risk transmitting HIV. We need to sort of take stock and say, good, good for us, global community, that's amazing. And that took a lot of investment, right? And we got, we got here, let's not lose that investment. What a, what a waste, right? What a waste of human accomplishment. Let's let this be the last generation, you know, affected by HIV and AIDS.
Hello, everybody, and I hope you enjoyed the screening of Undetectable. Um, I want to thank again TELUS Originals for supporting the film um, and also the Calgary Gay History Project um, and uh, Kevin Allen, who were producers on the film with me. Um, and uh, they're doing remarkable work that um, is having national impact. We're going to now move into the panel portion of the event. We are incredibly fortunate to have these panelists with us today. Dr. Julio Montaner is the executive director and physician in chief of the British Columbia Center for Excellence in HIV AIDS, Canada's largest research organization in HIV. And he is also a professor of medicine at the University of BC. Tico Kerr, 35 year long artistic practice has included bold explorations into painting, collage, drawing, printmaking, murals, performance, set design, all the while considering the politics of perception. Tico is a longtime thriver despite HIV and is committed to advocating to improving issues and situations relating to HIV AIDS. Of course, Tico can now add art director to that long list as he served as art director for our film Undetectable as well. Carrie Galke is a white settler, mother of twins, who was born, raised, and currently lives on the stolen terries, pardon me, on the stolen territories of what is known as Vancouver, BC. Carrie works as an, worked as an outreach worker with Vancouver Coastal Health for 11 years. In the past few years, her work has included supporting pregnant birthing parents diagnosed with substance use disorder. She recently completed a master's of public policy and social administration, social change leadership. She currently is the administrator for Parents Advocating Collectively for Kin, a project of BC Yukon Association of Drug War Survivors. Thank you everybody for joining me today and thanks for being in the film. Um, I do wanna say that the film started shooting certainly with Dr. Montana prior to our, uh, our COVID pandemic. Um, and then we continued through COVID if people are wondering about the timeline um, and points of view that were presented in the film. So Dr. Montana, I wanna start with you. Um, HIV AIDS was just starting to present in Vancouver when you first became involved. You were at the very beginning stages of it. Can you please share with us the experience of that time, how you came um, into, into the world of HIV AIDS uh, treatment? Uh, well, that's a bit of a long story, but uh, <laughs> uh, to make a long story short, uh, uh, I arrived in Vancouver in 1981. Uh, I came here to do a postdoctoral fellowship in respiratory medicine. And unbeknownst to me, at the same time that I was arriving in North America from Buenos Aires, my hometown at the time, uh, I, um, uh, I learned that uh, HIV, what ultimately was the, uh, characterized as HIV, uh, had arrived in uh, in uh, um, the major cities of uh, the United States at the time. Um, it wasn't until the uh, 84, 85, 86 years that uh, uh, this took off uh, significantly in Vancouver. And since I was doing a respiratory fellowship and the main uh, complication of people living with HIV at the time was a form of a lethal pneumonia, pneumocystis carina pneumonia, uh, that was a, what it was called at the time. Uh, the, uh, the basically the program requested that I look after people uh, coming into St. Paul's with uh, this form of pneumonia. The more I saw about it, the better I got at uh, treating it. Uh, we developed some research around it and we figured out a way to uh, both treat it and prevent it uh, to the point that uh, within a matter of years, pneumocystis pneumonia was no longer the challenge that it used to be, no longer the killer that it used to be. It could be prevented, but unfortunately, uh, our success in dealing with pneumocystis pneumonia uh, did not preclude the underlying disease from progressing. And so at about 1987, 88, uh, I had to make an executive decision, if you want, uh, and I decided to uh, basically uh, focus all of my energy in developing antiretroviral therapies, which is the name, the generic term, uh, for the HIV medications that ultimately, as you saw in the film, in 1996 at the Vancouver International AIDS Conference uh, gave us the opportunity to announce the emergence of this highly active antiretroviral therapy that really opened the door for all of the hope that you saw in the movie. Mm -hmm. Tico, you were instrumental in 
bringing community um, insight into that time. And you very bravely lived, uh, did some newspaper articles um, describing what it was like to live with HIV. Um, why did you decide at that time to come forward publicly? Um, as, as I know you were participating in Dr. Montana's trials as well. Uh, well, Laura, I, I, to be perfectly honest, I, I wasn't being particularly brave about it at all. Um, I was so fortunate to have been given a Julio as my physician. Um, and as you can see, as you're witnessing, his passion really triggered something in me to um, really get interested in my diagnosis and my treatment. And up until that time, I was rather cowardly about it. I was living in denial and it wasn't until meeting Julio and having someone that I could trust guide me through the next stages of what would be a, a good strategy that um, I, I, he instilled in me this uh, understanding that I had an opportunity that I could help people. And so I just kind of fell forward with his guidance. Um, but it's all Julio's fault. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I'm sure he's very persuasive. <laughs> um, Carrie, what are, you grew up in Vancouver. Um, what are your memories of that time? And is that, is, did you know that you wanted to work with these kinds of populations as you were growing up in Vancouver? What made you um, grow, uh, want to work with uh, individuals who were living with HIV? Uh, well, I, I went to school, I did a social service worker program and uh, I did my practicum at the Matt Clinic at the Downtown Community Health Clinic. And that was a, a pretty innovative program at the time. It's still still going today where they um, have a breakfast, breakfast program. People come in, get their meds, get breakfast. But if they don't come in, um, we would go out and uh, take the meds to them. So that was my first... Um, um, uh oh, fire alarm! Which, yeah, <laughs> I can turn that off. Um, that was my first experience with um, people with H HIV, um, but I'd been working a bit with that population. Oh, sorry. Um, um, yeah, and just uh, such a good experience working with this group of people and. Um, as I, as I say in the movie, it's just such a privilege that they, they let me into their life and it's just been a growth experience all, all around. I just want to turn off. Okay, great. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, no problem. Uh, we'll move on and, and uh, give you the opportunity to, to uh, figure out the alarm. But um, Dr. Montana, I, I would be remiss in not acknowledging that it's International Women's Day that we're recording this, uh, March 8th. So in... What are the are the additional barriers that you that you see um, facing um, women living with HIV? We we touch on it in the film, and uh, Angela Cato did a beautiful job in saying that the global face is female. Uh, what's your what's your thought on that, and what the additional barriers are that face women who are living with HIV? Well, I mean, let me first say that uh, the, the the face of the epidemic in uh, uh, in British Columbia was originally uh, the the most affected community was the gay community, uh, mm -hmm. and behind that uh, it became the uh, substance use uh, community, particularly injection drug users uh, or people who use drugs, injectable drugs, and. Uh, and, 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 and the other minorities, whether it's uh, 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 people from uh, abroad, uh, women, etc., uh, have been relatively a, a small, epidemiologically speaking, in, in, in Vancouver and in British Columbia. Uh, having said that, uh, uh, Angela uh, was right. Uh, at the global level, uh, more than half of the cases uh, are uh, in women, and uh, disproportionately so, uh, in the south of the world, particularly the African continent, and um, uh, and and as you can imagine, uh, every population has significant challenges that are unique to their circumstances. But uh, given uh, the day-to-day, -day, uh, I think it's fair to reflect on the fact that 
uh, uh, women, particularly in the areas where they are being most affected, uh, they suffer they suffer se serious challenges with regards to uh, childbearing, uh, uh, with regards to child rearing, uh, with regards to family support. They're often ostracized, finding very difficult to uh, uh, make um, ends meet. Oftentimes, uh, the, the the disease enters through the male partner. Uh, who often works uh, uh, elsewhere outside the community, uh, so they're uh, left to deal with their HIV and all of their responsibility for the family. Uh, in the earlier days, um, uh, premature death of the male partner would further aggravate the situation. So the, the challenges are innumerable. The, the beauty of uh, treatment of prevention, uh, as we have said many times, is that uh, it, 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 it erases a lot of these concerns uh, in as much as it uh, uh, protects the family unit as a whole, um, uh, it, 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 it protects the the, the father uh, uh, who is now healthy and able to earn a living uh, abroad if needed uh, to support that family. It protects the couple uh, so that there is no transmission of HIV if the infected member of the couple uh, is on antiretroviral therapy. It protects the the, the, the children uh, because. Uh, they will not be born with HIV if the parents are on treatment uh, as required. Uh, so, uh, and it protects the community uh, because uh, I remember back in the day when I was uh, uh, organizing the International AIDS Conference in, in, in Cape Town, uh, where, I, where I was the president of the International AIDS Society, uh, flying in and out uh, to, you know, basically negotiate all of the different aspects of it for a couple of years ahead of time. And every time I went in, uh, the headlines were basically the same. Uh, uh, within the next decade, we anticipate a shortage of uh, teachers because of the HIV epidemic. Uh, the next uh, week, it was uh, a shortage of uh, 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 security guards, police, uh, uh, bureaucrats, uh, you name it, everything, doctors, nurses, everything. The, the community was being uh, uh, completely eroded by the impact of HIV. And I'm happy to say that as treatment of prevention uh, basically e expanded throughout the continent, although not to the extent that it should, uh, but at least to the extent that it has, uh, we have seen remarkable improvements in this regard. Many, many more, ma many more investments need to be done in order to optimally deploy uh, uh, the, the programs uh, so that we can optimize the return on our investment. But uh, I am only hoping, hoping that, that these activities where we engage a community I I increasing their knowledge about what it can be done uh, will help us to, uh, to get there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the treatment as prevention and, and certainly the, the, dis the discovery, if, you, if that's the right word, to use for, if, um, for undetectable status leading to untransmittable, that is, um, that is a remarkable thing that you must uh, remember hearing, Tico, when you realized, when you were told that you could no longer transmit the virus, um, what were your thoughts during that time? Um, and how was that transformative um, in the way you, you view living with HIV AIDS? Um, well, uh, kind of the, the, the turning point for me with my particular experience with HIV was in um, 2005, um, when all the medications stopped working for me, and um, with Julio's help, we decided to apply for uh, compassionate access to two new drugs that were uh, very uh, promising overseas, but hadn't been licensed yet in Canada. Um, and it was a long, hard fight, and we were rejected, and we had to be very public about it, um, and it was rather harrowing. Um, but I was finally given the drugs, uh, and I'll, I'll also say, and, and a small group of men that was in the um, cohort that I was with, uh, we were given the drugs um, early in January of uh, 2006, and within five days, the amount of virus in our systems dropped by 90%, and we became undetectable almost immediately. Um, and it wasn't just the, the peace of mind and... <clears throat> the psychological uh, benefits of it all, but I felt my health coming back. And I and all of a sudden I had breath and I had stamina and I had hope. 
and all these things transform it uh, overnight. And uh, I realized that uh, we had really stumbled onto something really effective and that's really going to be a game changer. So everything changed in 2006 and happily those drugs are, are available to pretty much everyone now. Yeah, it's, uh, I, when I was speaking to some other individuals for the film, it's almost, uh, they say it in the, uh, one of the subjects says it in the film, it's almost too good to be true. Like when I was growing yeah. up, it was a terminal diagnosis. It's very difficult to hear this and understand it. Dr. Montana, you would like to speak to that? And then, uh, Carrie, I'd like to hear your point of view on it with your clients. You know, uh, as uh, Tico uh, and you were reflecting on it, uh, uh, it comes to mind an experience that I had with a, with a friend of mine, uh, Nikos Dedes. Uh, he's a Greek activist uh, that uh, uh, I worked with him internationally for many, many, many years. Uh, he was a young guy when he came to the Vancouver Conference in 1996. And so, in that case, it was me presenting the first triple therapy trial uh, that showed the promise, uh, not yet uh, fully understood, but the promise of suppressing viral load to undetectable levels. Uh, and as a result of that, bringing back your immunity and making you healthy and so on and so forth. So he went home back to Greece. He had been recently diagnosed and not on treatment at the time. And he, he said to his clinician, uh, I want to take what Dr. Montaner talked about, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, uh, those news spread very quickly and hard, highly active antiretroviral therapy became the norm, so he could access it in, the, in, the, in, the, in Greece. Um, I didn't know any about this. And it, uh, in 2006, I, um, I presented the first proposal for treatment as prevention at the Toronto International Conference, and, uh, and I had to recruit somebody from the community to help me uh, you know, do some stuff. And I went after uh, Nikos uh, because I knew him, uh, and. Uh, and, and, you know, we worked together again. And at one point, you know, at one of those public events, uh, he, he said, you know, Julio, in 1996, you saved my life. Uh, I didn't want to take treatment, but when I saw you uh, showing your results on ACT, at, at that time it was ACT, DDI, and uh, I thought, I'll give it a try. But he said, in 2006, you actually save myself from my own uh, stigma and discrimination. You lifted a monster that I had living within me that I didn't know was there. Because when you told us that if you were undetectable, you would not transmit for the first time ever, uh, I, I then had something lifted from me that I didn't know was there. And I came to realize that you saved me from death in 2000, in, in 1996, but you saved my life as it should be uh, thereafter when you came up with the notion that I would not infect my partner. And that was, he told me, for me, life changing. And for me, it was life changing too, because uh, uh, <laughs> it, it gave me a, a realization of the potential impact that this strategy could have, not just morbidity, mortality, transmission, cost savings that it could generate, but actually how it can be life changing for people affected with HIV and for those uh, that are close to them. Is the best Carrie, do you find... mm -hmm. Yeah. Carrie, do you find within the people that you like within your clients and the community and the community that you work in that they that there's still some disbelief when it comes to treatment as prevention and U equals U, um, undetectable equals tr untransmittable. Uh, what, what do your clients say to you when you say the ARVs can bring them to this position of living a long and healthy and happy life uh, and they happen to be HIV positive? Uh, I mean, the stigma runs deep. I think um, we still need to get that messaging out there. When I tell my clients undetectable means untransmittable, it, it's often a big surprise. So, um, but that has been a big game changer. I, in fact, one of the nurses we work with, um, he came out about his HIV status when that U equal U, U equals U um, campaign happened. Um, so I feel like that messaging has been a huge game changer. So why do you feel like the messaging is, 
it's still not widely known. It's even within certain, you know, communities, like it, within the wider community, it's not widely known. When I spoke to my friends about this, this project, none of them really understood where HIV was now after, you know, popular, popular culture, uh, you know, Magic Johnson, you know, like, oh yeah, what happened? There must have been a vaccine, you know, like it's just kind of fallen off of people's, a lot of people's radars. And why that conversation of this amazingly good news, which it is an amazingly good news story, is not is not widely known. It's a kind of a question for everyone, but we'll start with you, uh, Carrie. It's it's so true. I talk to uh, friends that don't know, and uh, so I feel like that messaging still needs to get out there. Um, and this film is is one way of, of that happening. Peak. Tico, why do you feel like um, this isn't more widely known and um, and celebrated? It's a, a remarkable Canadian achievement uh, by the BC Centre, and and uh, you know I, I I just always question why more people don't know about it and and take it as a na point of national pride, really. Well, it's very true that. Um... It's fallen off people's radar, um, but to be perfectly honest, I mean, people are inundated with so many issues right now, um, to say nothing of COVID and so on. I, I can only speak uh, in in uh, regard to my own experience. Um, you know, my recovery from HIV was uh, very public. It was in the newspapers and and so on and so forth. And and. Um, so I kind of became this testament to um, it's curable now. And so I think that I might have inadvertently contributed to the um, misinformation that um, um, HIV is a, a thing of the past. I mean, I, 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 I bounce around with a lot of energy. So it looks like and it is uh, very much a, a reality that uh, I've been giving my life back and uh, I'm the same as pretty much every man my age now happily. Um, but um, I do think that um, it's it's the people that aren't getting the treatments that uh, we need to be focusing on, obviously, and how to get that out there. Um, I think it's it's very challenging. But as Carrie said, this film is a is a wonderful opportunity to to make that statement in the community. Dr. Montana, why do you feel like the treatment as prevention is not a nationally adopted strategy? This is a bit of a a big question for you, and I um, I know it's complex, so, so first, but uh, I am curious. I have, to have a, I have to have a therapeutic intervention here. Uh, Tico, it's not your fault. Uh, <laughs> And if anything, it's a collective uh, problem. I mean, uh, yes, uh, we are victims of our own success uh, in the sense that uh, uh, it was easy to talk about HIV and AIDS where people were dying on the streets and you could see people with Kaposi sarcoma, uh, uh, you know, basically walking down Davis Street in, in the downtown uh, Vancouver. So, yes, I, I get it. However, uh, the real reason why treatment prevention has not been effectively implemented uh, in this country is first and foremost because of the lack of political will. Uh, and we owe it to uh, Mr. Harper and his administration, uh, who kindly, in 2006, when we offered to launch a national treatment prevention program, uh, uh, I was told by Tony Clement, Minister of Health at the time, uh, that they were not interested. And by the way, Julio, uh, uh, you are the reason why there is so much transmission uh, because of all of the work that you do around injection drug use and supporting uh, the communities affected. That was the environment under which we work. We were spied on by the RCMP and the VPD. Uh, we were subjected to all kinds of harassment by our political leaders. And why our institutions were happy to basically tell us, look, as long as you're doing your work and you're not making too much noise, you're going to be fine. So there is a lack of political will. Uh, uh, since then, the new administration, the Liberal government took over in 2015, and within a month, uh, they adopted our proposal for treatment prevention nationally, and the so-called 90-90-90 target, of which I'm the proudly so, the father, uh, uh, and the 95 95 95 since then, uh, uh, which is a subsequent sort of target that we're currently operating under. However, 
uh, uh, Jane Philpott, who was the Minister of Health at the time, and I'm uh, grateful to her and the, the Prime Minister, Minister, Prime Minister Trudeau for, for the support. But unfortunately, uh, uh, I came to realize that even with their support, uh, and I had the support of the Attorney General and a number of other very high-ranking politicians, Stephen Lewis, President Clinton, you name it, uh, nothing really happened all that much across the country because when I walk into the offices of the Minister of Health in various provinces that I'm not going to name, uh, their interest was basically rather limited. Uh, and, uh, and why? Well, because uh, the, 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 we cannot address in this country major public health challenges across the country with a system that is so fractionated uh, between provinces. And I realized that my own province is proud to have a successful provincial program. But unfortunately, until we don't fix the Canadian HIV pro problem, we cannot fix the Canadian problem. And the bad news is that we cannot fix the Canadian problem until we don't fi fix the continental and the, and the global problem. And so we are on this together. You hear that all the time for COVID. Uh, you hear all the time how uh, everything is on the table and that we're going to do everything possible. And in all honesty, I don't believe any of that. Uh, uh, a political uh, uh, attention span is very limited. Their willingness to get their hands and feet dirty to fix the problems that we know exist is very limited. And unless we take these issues seriously and we commit the resources and the, the leadership that is necessary, this is not going to happen. And the sad part of that is people are going to suffer. Infections are going to continue to grow. Uh, let me just say, uh, BC infection rates is down and has been down ever since over the last 20 years. Uh, it is the contrary uh, uh, trend across the country. Uh, and why? Because HIV is no longer a priority. Uh, and so uh, all I can say is I'm not going to give up, but in all honesty, uh, we need a lot more than me in order to make this happen. And I welcome all of you being here today because this is a way to get that, that ball rolling, but we need a lot more than this and I need every single person here uh, to engage in a conversation to say, why are we not doing this yet? That's a, that's a great segue to our uh, audience, our first audience question um, from Camper Van 671. <laughs> For anyone on the panel, and I think Dr. Montana, you uh, spoke to this Ella, beautifully, um, but what can we do as viewers with the knowledge of treatment as prevention what can we do to enact change uh, nationally? That's a, uh, Carrie, would you like to start? Sure, I, I would start with saying, spread the word. Let's just talk about it, keep the conversation going. And don't only talk about treatment as prevention, but talk about undetectable equals untransmittable. Uh, that messaging needs to get out there. Mm -hmm. What do you feel, Tico? I know, um, through your art, you're also an activist, of course, and I appreciate you bringing your beautiful um, aesthetic to our film um, and, and allowing us uh, to uh, to work with you as an art director. So how do you feel people can can uh, affect change within their own communities? Well, well, just off the top of my head, I don't believe any of us really engage enough with our members of parliament, uh, our uh, uh, political uh, representatives we need to be on top of them, not just around election time, but on top of them all the time. Uh, it's the only uh, way that things seem to happen. So I, I think that's a very uh, effective, very um, immediate method of, um, of getting the ball rolling. And I just want to revisit something you said, Dr. Montaner, just to make sure it's crystal clear. BC has seen a reduction, like a dramatic reduction using treatment as prevention um, in HIV infection rates. But I just want to make it clear, all the rest of Canada are seeing increases. Is that correct? Correct. The trend overall in Canada is a continued increase in HIV new infections. Uh, and uh, uh, that, that's for Canada as a whole. But I am here to tell you, that British Columbia has seen continuous declines in new infections uh, since we started these campaigns back in 1986. On the, on the point of what needs to be done, uh, I agree with my colleagues. 
uh, we need to continue the conversation, talk about it to everybody that is prepared to listen to you. But more importantly, as Tico said, demand action and don't compromise and demand it, demand it and demand it. And not just, uh, as, as Kerry said, not just about treatment prevention or U equals U, but actually everything else that goes with it. We cannot uh, have a successful program if we don't have harm reduction programs for people who use drugs or we, we don't have safer drug supply uh, for those that are using street drugs. Uh, there, there are many layers that need to be built about, uh, upon it. This is not just about giving or, or throwing, as I often say, pills to the people. Uh, we need to create an environment where treatment, PrEP, uh, harm reduction, social support, everything actually is available so that we can ensure a sustainable response, which at the end of the day, uh, will change the outcome for the individual, his or her uh, uh, immediate entourage, but also the, all of the society. Yeah, Carrie, um, this brings me to, you know, to Johnny, um, whom, you know, you work so closely with, your whole team did, lovely, kind guy who, you know, was very forthcoming with us and our camera crew to help affect change. But he, he passed away, but it was due to uh, overdose, correct? He was uh, on his ARVs. That's right. Um, yeah, and he worked most closely with Yasmin, the nurse in that, that segment. Um, it, it's so sad because that, again, is a preventable death. And um, I mean, I think, I think it's a, I think our nation should be embarrassed by not treating this overdose crisis as it should. He should still be with us. Mm -hmm. He had so much, he had just reconnected with his family. And uh, yeah, it's, it's so very sad. And we're seeing increasing number of deaths all the time, record-breaking deaths. Um, and, just, and, the, and that's what the STOP team did so beautifully is trying to support people through all of their, the complexities within their life. Is, is that a fair assessment? Yeah, and I mean, the, the STOP team, they, they support people where they're at and uh, a lot of the people we're supporting are, are dealing with the um, pretty deep addictions. And, that, and not everyone's Tico, ready for treatment. I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Tico, I wanted to ask you, when I was speaking with a young queer man um, about this project, you know, anecdotally, um, he's like, well, you know, it's not such a big deal anymore because it's just a pill and you can live with it. And like, what's your reaction to that? Um, um, and, and also, and then we can get into prep, which I really do want to talk about, which we didn't talk about in the film. Right, right. Um, well, I'm, I'm quite consumed by this notion that um, this remarkable history that we've had in developing um, tools to fight HIV, um, the story um, is getting lost. And it will get lost if we don't continue to talk about it and celebrate it and um, remind people that it's uh, not a fait accompli. Um, it, it, um, I completely understand um, younger generations of, of queer people and um, young people just in generally, but they don't usually get the whole story of what we went through. Um, it's treated more in a historical context uh, rather than kind of a living context. And I think we need to do more about that um, by keeping the, the story alive. Mm -hmm. And what do you mean by a, a living context? What are, what are you still living with? Like, obviously you're undetectable, but what are the ramifications in your current, in your current life? Um, you know, I, I've been given my life back and I don't really see it as changing at all. Nothing is really, uh, there's no nothing detrimental that's uh, happening to my performance or my abilities or anything. But um, um, I, I, I really feel um, that there, we've got an important history and it's, it's wonderful that tell us and you, Laura, have, have come together to create this opportunity to um, to keep the story alive uh, because it is it, it's not past tense you know 
it, it's still the mm -hmm. people that aren't getting the treatment, the marginalized populations that are still suffering uh, yeah, in ignorance uh, of, of the opportunities. I, I, um, there's a question from an audience member and um, Dr. Montana, this might be because uh, <laughs> we, we talked to each other so quite a few years ago now as the film has progressed uh, when we did that interview with you. But um, the question is for the entire panel, what was your favorite part about working on the film and or when you were viewing the film? So uh, Tico, why don't we start with you because you were the art, the, you know, you were graciously agreed to uh, take my call and become the art director. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I'm I'm really my favorite part was working with you, Laura, and and for being given the opportunity to think in a new medium, which is you know these collage cutouts and transmitting ideas into two dimensional kind of collage. I, I, it was really an exciting um, way to get through the pandemic. Actually, you know we. we since we were isolated from each other, we we did everything um, online, and um, it was a it was actually a really beneficial experience for me. Um, but uh, apart from that, um, I'm a huge fan of Julio's, and everything that he he touches is um, remarkable to me. And I certainly would not be here uh, if he hadn't been around. And Carrie, you absolutely glowed in the piece. And, and I can see your commitment and your kindness um, and you're on the front line. So uh, I'm really, I'm really um, very grateful to be part of a team that includes um, all of you. Thank you. Gracious as always, Tico. Uh, Carrie, what did you, you know, you allowed us to, and your client, you know, your clients, the stop team were so gracious to allow us um to come in and tell you and tell the stop story um especially you know we were very careful to shoot appropriately during covid but we all we did shoot um during that time as well so i just uh, what are your memories of shooting and and what were some what was some of the feedback um well i'd say my my favorite part of the filming was um filming with you and the film crew that was a lot of fun um, and in viewing, it's just watching the exceptional work of my coworkers. They are such amazing people. And one thing that doesn't come out in the film, there are a lot of men on our team. Um, yes. But, um, yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but, <laughs> everyone, and they were at seeming less willing to be filmed. Um, but mm. uh, it, it's been a good, positive experience. A little different in the beginning and, uh, you know, pre-COVID and post-COVID, um, and I don't, may not have noticed, I, I um, have a different bike in the second part. I use my bike, so the stop team, I started out on the stop team when there were just four of us and we were a pilot project. Um, it became a, a full uh, program when they started, the, the number of people at, at St. Paul's were declining on the HIV ward. Um, but in 10 years, my bike was never stolen during COVID, my bike got stolen. Yeah. So yeah. So there is a continuity error there. You're right. <laughs> You're right. Um, Dr. Montana, what do you? Um, this is a question, perhaps for both of us. What audiences do you hope this film will reach? And how do you do? You feel? I'm hoping this can further the conversation. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, uh, I think that this is the kind of uh, uh, initiative that I'm happy to engage with as a means to reach uh, previously untouched sort of uh, audiences. Uh, uh, my hope is that this will, uh, you know, leak uh, throughout uh, uh, our society and uh, give an opportunity for this uh, issue to be brought up to the table and. Uh, and, uh, and uh, for friends, families uh, to say, do you see uh, what's going on with HIV? And, uh, you know, isn't it too bad that, that Canada's rates are not uh, going down and we don't deliver on the promise of a Canadian uh, public health initiative that actually uh, could revolutionize the world? In fact, uh, it has revolutionized the world. Our treatment and prevention strategy has been endorsed by the United Nations uh, and, and it, it has provided the roadmap 
uh, for a program for towards the elimination of AIDS as a pandemic by 2030. And unfortunately, uh, the way things are going, uh, it may happen in British Columbia and a few other jurisdictions around the world, uh, but uh, this is not the way uh, it should be. It should be a global, a truly global effort. Uh, so I do hope that that this, this kind of uh, engagement, and this is the part that I enjoy about doing this kind of work, is that uh, try to convey the message to uh, every single person out there. Uh, this is something that you can get uh, behind because it's, it's really a winner. And all we need to do is convince our political and public health leaders that this must be done. Um, mm -hmm. and, and when you say who, everybody. Uh, they, you know, I don't discriminate when it comes to these things. Uh, we need everybody. We need men and women and young and old and uh, queer and not. I don't really care, Every, everybody. Uh, because uh, the only way we're going to fix this is that if there is a swelling of support coming from community. I'm going to tell you an anecdote that Tico didn't tell you that is, I think, extremely valuable. Uh, and he told you pieces of it, but I, I, there is something that I want to emphasize. Tico was dying. Tico, you don't mind me saying this, right? No, not at all. Okay, <laughs> I, I didn't take uh, informed consent. I, I think he I, I knows. I think he knows. You know what we're talking about. I said, Tico was dying, and we were trying to get these experimental drugs that I had negotiated from Europe uh, to, to give him a new cocktail that I knew would work in him. And the bureaucrats would not allow me to bring the drugs uh, for him, him and five other people, uh, because they were saying that, oh, no, the, the risk of, of, of side effects of two new experimental drugs is unacceptable. And we kept on saying, come on, guys, wake up and smell the coffee. Uh, the risk of untreated AIDS when it's terminal is actually death, and it's death within your, you know, your your, your short-term calendar. Um, and, and we tried, and we tried, and, and I talked to the Minister of Health, and, and an election was called, and the whole thing was falling apart. And finally, one of the individuals that was in that group died, and I was really mad. And Tico came to see me, and he says, Julio, what are we going to do now? And I said, well, Tico, now it's up to you. And he looked at me and he says, Julio, what do you mean up to me? I'm a painter. I mean, what am I supposed to do? And I said, well, Tico, uh, every uh, uh, high shot uh, company, CEO, or whatever else across the country has a Tico curve in their corporate office. I want you to call your agent and ring them all one by one and let them know that your country is denying you access to what is going to save your life and otherwise you're going to die. Well, guess what? Tico bought into it. The next day, uh, we had the press, every single press, writing an article about Tico. And guess what happened then? Health Canada relented. We got the drugs, and the other five people, Tico included, uh, they are alive today. They were actually... Mm -hmm. In, on the way out. And the point that I'm making is that you don't know when the breakthrough is going to happen. But, but it took that interaction between my, me and Tico for Tico to deliver what I could not deliver with all of my intellectual and uh, research. And all. So we need, we, I don't know where this is going to happen. I don't know if Kerry is going to do it or Laura is going to do it, Peter, Paul, or Mary. But I want every <laughs> single one of us, you, uh, to, to understand that Tico, who didn't think he had the pool that we needed, actually made it happen for himself, for, for that cohort. And since then, that treatment became a, a standard of therapy for people with highly resistant uh, HIV infection. So, yes, we can, any one of us at any given time can change the world. All we need is to press for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was said in the film and, you know, ACT UP and subsequent movements. Um, that political will, it moves by social action. And it doesn't need Go to ahead. be, it can, that can take the form of many things. It doesn't have to be um, angry mobs in the streets, certainly, but uh, sharing the story, sharing this, for me, it's such a good news story. And, you know, when you talk about a good news story related to a virus these days, I think everybody could use a good news story. And it, like, I, I think that really needs to be stressed. What a remarkable 
distance we've come thanks to people like you, Dr. Montana and Tico and Carrie, that we've come from when I first heard about AIDS, it was terrifying as a teenager, kind of talking about revealing my age here. It was terrifying. You know, like we were scared to even kiss our, our partners. But and to where we are now in our lifetime and that that's not widely known and celebrated and saying, you know, this is the solution. Let's move forward. Um, it's a good news story. So let's, you know, I really want the good news to be shared and to be, you know, broadened <laughs> uh, knowledge base wise. Um, I'd like to talk about what we don't talk about in the film, because, you know, there's just so much you can do in a film um, shot during COVID times is um, prep. A lot of people talk about prep and what it is and, and how it can be used. Um, I don't know, Dr. Montana, do you wanna take this on? What is PrEP and how does it relate to lowering community viral load? So, so far we've been talking about treatment uh, uh, as the optimal means to offer a therapeutic option to people who are infected with HIV the treatment consists of typically three drugs. Modern alternatives now consist of less, two drugs maybe, but the traditional treatment used to be three drugs. And so uh, if we stand, stay with that uh, sort of old paradigm, the three drugs would uh, uh, drive the virus to undetectable levels. That would allow the CD4 or the immune response to be reestablished. With that, people don't get sick with AIDS. With that uh, premature uh, death, as a secondary uh, to AIDS will not happen. And in addition, for no, no additional investment, you prevent HIV transmission. So the impact of this intervention is massive and the return on the investment from a cost effectiveness perspective is incredible to the point that is cost saving. In medicine, there are very few things that are cost saving. This is one of them. And that's the reason why it has been now adopted around the world, north, south, east, and west, everywhere. Now, for people who are not infected with HIV, uh, uh, that are at high risk for HIV infection, we can now demonstrate that by using a reduced regimen, in this case would be two drugs uh, in one pill, so one pill once a day, for example, although there are other regimens, but that this is the one that we use more commonly, so one pill once a day uh, would make it so that if they come across HIV sexually or otherwise, the likelihood of them to contract infection would be reduced by greater than 90%. So in addition to treatment and prevention, which so treatment protects the, the, the health of the person infected with HIV and secondarily protects those that may come across them sexually or otherwise. In addition to that, you can put in a second layer of protection offering pre pre-exposure prophylaxis. So prophylaxis before you become exposed to the virus uh, to individuals who are at high risk. In British Columbia, over the last four years, uh, we have made the PrEP program, uh, courtesy of our uh, NDP government, who was very willing to accept this uh, challenge on our part. Uh, we, we made it available free of charge to every uh, BC resident that is at high risk of contracting uh, HIV. And since then, we have had almost 8,000 8, people on treatment. Currently about 5,000 are steady on treatment with pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP. And as a result of that, we have seen an additional decrease of new infections over and beyond the success of treatment and prevention uh, that we have quantified it at approximately an additional 30% decrease on HIV new infections. So altogether, extremely good news, very safe regimen, extremely uh, cost-effective, very inexpensive, and very easy to take. So we wonder why we don't have these across the country, everywhere, all the time. Again, political will. Mm -hmm. Carrie, do you see PrEP being used within the, with the communities that you work in? Is it wild, do they feel that it's widely accepted and, and uh, used? Uh, well, not on my caseload. My, I'm, my caseload was more in the downtown east side, um, but I do have friends that are on PrEP. Um, so 
I, I, I think there is um, definitely some wider use of it. Um, there's a question from the audience. My understanding is that HIV is no, now mostly transmitted through intravenous drug use. Is that not the case? Perhaps it could be different in BC. It, perhaps it's different in BC, not nationally or internationally. Uh, Dr. Montana? Uh, you know, I, I had to look carefully at the recent statistics uh, not to make a fool of myself. Uh, but um, while it is true that uh, there is a significant amount of transmission happening as a result of uh, injection drug use, needle cherry in that case, um, uh, uh, my, the, the, the rates of transmission in British Columbia have re been reduced remarkably, but we still have uh, a, a sexual transmission uh, playing a significant role. And in fact, I would risk to say that even though sexual transmission is a fraction of what we used to be, given that it was the, the volume was so much bigger to begin with, it's still predominant in BC. But uh, uh, I'll take a rain check and I'll have to check on that the statistic to be 100% sure. Globally, yeah, I, think, um, uh, uh, globally I must say, uh, sexual transmission it, it continues to be the, the, the predominant means and heterosexual transmission continues to be a, a major driver globally of HIV transmission. Although in some mm -hmm. regions vary, for example, in Eastern Europe, uh, I I injection drug use is predominant. Uh, so you have to be careful. It's very geographically or socio-demographically dependent. And certainly those, uh, those demographics can change. Um, as uh, to not take things for granted that, oh, in BC, it's this. That can change, obviously, um, as, as the virus moves through a community, correct? Like, like, as you say, women are predominantly the, one in, the ones infected within certain countries in Africa. Yeah, I, mean, uh, the, I don't know, know if that was a question. The, <laughs> no, look, I, I mean, the, the virus doesn't follow any rules. Uh, the only rule that the virus falls is that if there is a host that is susceptible, uh, it will take advantage of it. And so the issue here is that we have the tools to stop the virus by giving treatment to people who are infected, no matter what social demographic profile they have. And, and treatment prevention works for sexual, parenteral, or in other words, the needle transmission or vertical transmission, meaning the, from the infected mother or father uh, to, the, to the child. So it works in every aspect. If, if you are mm -hmm. uh, a, a member of zero discordant couple, meaning that you have uh, a sex or sh share needles with a person that is uh, HIV infected, you can protect yourself by using PrEP. It has been shown to work. Uh, as Kerry indicated, uh, PrEP has not had a great penetration in the injection drug using community because the, most of the early work uh, was in uh, uh, men who have sex with men, or to a lesser degree uh, in women uh, instead of discordant couples. And so there, there was this fixation that, oh, well, we have shown that it works for sexual infections, but we don't know if it's going to work for others. It works for everybody. Uh, and so if, 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 if uh, you're involved in a situation where you are likely to come across the virus, it is high risk situation through any means PrEP is actually to be recommended. I, um, there's been recent news, um, and I think it captured the news uh, attention because of the company whose name was behind it, Moderna. Uh, there was news that I saw related to a new vaccine that they're uh, doing early trials, or forgive me, I don't know the scientific language, but um, regarding a vaccine for HIV, what what's new there, and um, and then maybe Tico, you can follow up on what you feel are possibly the community barriers of of if that was if that was successful. There's still barriers to to that implementation. But Dr. Montana, what what's the news and and feedback on this new vaccine that was in the news recently? So uh, I'm now in my mid 60s. Uh, I started doing this work uh, in the early 80s. And every year, uh, a group or a different group 
uh, claims that within the next five to 10 years, we will have the vaccine. Uh, and a separate group will claim that within the next five to 10 years, we will have the cure. Um, I learned when I was an intern back in the day and, uh, and you're in the emergency room, when you get a call that an emergency comes, uh, don't postpone the nap that you were going to have because it may or may not come. So you do what is right now and then you worry about the emergency. Um, this is the situation. Uh, there are lots of promising leads. Uh, yes, it may happen, but yes, it has not happened. And we cannot allow the promise of a vaccine or the promise of a cure to serve as, as an excuse for us not to do what we know it can be done today to transform what it used to be a pandemic into a very small and controllable endemic disease. By now, everybody knows what I'm talking about because COVID has made us all proficient on the epidemic language. So the, <laughs> the fact is that we are very encouraged by the mRNA vaccines uh, being given a try in the HIV field. Uh, there have been increasing number of individuals who have been cured for HIV uh, through very complicated uh, regimens that are not reproducible. Uh, we now have at least three or four, uh, uh, and that may open a door for the future. But guess what? I may not be alive to see those uh, 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 research projects uh, being completed, uh, successfully so. But by, before I'm dead, I could actually deliver you a 90% reduction on HIV AIDS, infection, morbidity, and mortality globally by doing what we know and what we have today, which we know is cost effective. So let's not yeah, uh, lose sight of what it needs and it should be done and it should be done today. Yeah, absolutely. Tico, do you feel that the stigma surrounding HIV um, is still prevalent? And do you feel like that is getting in the way of reaching those 90, 90, 90 goals by the UN? Well, <clears throat> I can only speak from my own experience, and I and I, my sense is that as a gay man, it's not um, it's not difficult to access and come to um, face um, an HIV infection. It's um, it's not uncommon. Um, I don't believe that there's a terrible stigma. Um, uh, it's kind of generational, actually. Um, in, a, in a lot of ways, but I think um, as we've seen in the film, um, the sti stigma still um, um, is very much a part of um, our marginalized uh, and racialized populations in particular. So those are the ones that really um, are having a, a very, very hard time um, dealing with it. And um, we have uh, a lot of tools in our box to um, actually deal with them on a, on a sociological um, as well as a medical um, level. So uh, as I say, I, do, I don't believe there's much stigma in the downtown core of <laughs> major uh, North American cities. I think if, if you go to some of the other provinces and to some of um, our uh, more rural populations, um, there definitely is a stigma and there's definitely barriers to uh, getting treatment. Right, I wanna thank uh, Laura D for that question, uh, who that was an audience question. And uh, Laura, I love your name. Speaking from me personally, like I am, uh, I, I live in Calgary of all places for a filmmaker to live. And I'm, I prou I'm a proud Calgarian. Um, and uh, I, I do feel, even with what I do for a living, um, individuals that are in my life that have nothing to do with my work, um, totally unrelated fields that I know. And when I started doing this film, they came forward to me and said they were undetectable, that they were living with HIV. And I think it had a lot to do with not knowing if they were safe to share that information. Who, you, you know, Laura, I know you kind of do this, but is it safe for me to talk to you about this? And, you know, I, I really appreciate them sharing that very personal part of their lives, but I think normalizing the conversation will help decrease the stigma within general society. And then people will go get tested, will access treatment as prevention, will become undetectable and see that they can have full lives. But the fact that 
individuals that I'm close with didn't tell me that I've known for years <laughs> um, until I started doing this film and they knew that I was probably a safe person. Um, really speaks to how we need to just kind of open the doors to safe spaces and safe conversations. Um, that's my soapbox. Carrie, how do you feel um, that uh, encouraging people to, to go on ARVs what are um, and stay on their ARVs within the communities that you work on, what's been the most successful strategy that you've seen within your own work? For me, just sharing my own experience where I've seen people on ARVs live very healthy lives and I've seen people not take them die. Uh, I also have had housemates with, with, uh, with HIV who were probably the healthiest in our household. So I, I've um, shared, shared my own personal stories with others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I th again, I think that shared experience is really important. There was a, a question earlier. Um, let me just go up here. Is is there is HIV from this is a question from Aaron. Is there still HIV AIDS education in high schools? Does anyone know the answer to that? I can speak to it anecdotally because I have teenage daughters, <laughs> but um, does anyone here know for certain? No. Uh, one of the subjects in the panel or in the film, Mark Randall does um, HIV uh, education work here in Calgary and he's very funny. And um, But the, the funding to bring him and his colleagues into schools has evaporated of course, COVID makes it more complex for anybody to go in there. Uh, my daughters learn about HIV, but in a very clinic, like a very like very surface level, um, very no none of the history. Uh, it's kind of taught in a glancing way, uh, like other STIs. Um, and so uh, my daughters probably know more than the average 15 year olds and 13 year olds, but um, I wouldn't say that I feel like their education on HIV is at all uh, um, appropriate, like, uh, as much as it should be in my opinion within their, within their sexual education classes. Um, and so uh, I will say that uh, uh, Undetectable is available on YouTube for anyone to share and send around to their communities, send into their schools, send to their teachers. TELUS is uh, wonderful at making films completely accessible and free. Um, and we've also, TELUS also allowed for it to be placed within distribution centers where they place it in, into universities and colleges. So Undetectable is very widely, um, widely, available and uh you know i would really love it if, if everybody here could share the film to share the message and to also celebrate the remarkable work of the bc center for excellence in hiv aids and carrie and tico um so uh yeah uh, i think you know Ms. dr montana already has a postage stamp on with his face on it but uh, i think that it should <laughs> i think his uh, <laughs> his uh the acknowledgement of the remarkable achievements should go uh, even further than that. I do have a big question um, to end the panel, if you don't mind, uh, because each one of you have overcome amazing obstacles, setbacks. You have, you know, you've seen people that you love pass from this horrible disease. Um, how do you stay motivated to continue to do your work um, and so passionate about it? Is it that it's a bit of a big question, Carrie? Why don't we start with you? Um, and how do you keep going? And uh, even with that, with the setbacks, what's your motivation? I mean, I went back to school, and because I felt like I was supporting the status quo, I wasn't seeing. I mean, I was seeing the decline in HIV, but an increase in overdoses. And so I I went back to school to do a master's in public policy because I think policy needs to change. And uh, taking a page from ACT UP, um, working very closely with DELF, the Drug User Liberation Front, and we are getting illicit drugs and testing them and giving them out to help save lives. So that must be rewarding to try to decrease the overdose death is what you find. 
um, that you're finding reward in in your work nowadays. That's great. Kiko, what about, about you? What? Oh, sorry, go ahead, Carrie. I was just going to say, I, I don't know how rewarding it is. It's more, it feels like a necessity because these are preventable deaths, just like HIV. Mm -hmm. What about you, Tico? What keeps you motivated to continue to share your story and to work in a, as an activist artist? Well, it's, <clears throat> it's, it's an enormous question. It, it's, it's celebrating give, uh, being given back my life. Um, and I r realize the responsibility that uh, is implied with that. And I just try to lead by example and uh, talk about issues like HIV with my work. Um, I love checking in with Julio from time to time to see how we can strategize and do something else because it's really fun and it's really wonderful to feel effective. Um, and um, I, I, there's still a lot of fight left in us. Um, I mean, some days I'm motivated by anger and frustration and other days I'm motivated by gratitude. Um, and I'm a highly imperfect individual, but I uh, kind of <laughs> um, vacillate between uh, those kind of things and just get my work done. Is that <laughs> is, is that a good yeah, answer? No, I, <laughs> I don't know. I also am in, I also am motivated by uh, rage and gratitude. So I I, I appreciate that answer, uh, <laughs> Doctor Montana. Why don't we give you the last word? You know, uh, in the early days, uh, uh, things were very uh, dark and bleak uh, because no matter what we did, uh, uh, the prognosis of uh, uh, people living with HIV uh, was uniformly fatal in a rather short order. In those days, we were diagnosing people when they already had symptomatic disease, uh, so things were very desperate. Um, and as uh, it was described in the, in the, in the movie, um, uh, it was, uh, for us, the short-term goals of uh, achieving something meaningful for every single one of our patients uh, uh, was very valuable. Uh, as, as we became more intellectually involved in the work that we were doing, uh, and I started to see through the data uh, that there was hope at the uh, end of the tunnel, uh, that became an increasing force in moving us forward and giving us the hope that there was more yet to be derived from the effort, the therapeutic effort, and so on and so forth. But as, as 2006 uh, uh, arrived, and, uh, and we were looking at our own data, uh, realizing that uh, treatment as prevention could actually be the dramatic game changer that actually turned out to be, uh, then the, the, the level of uh, passion, anger, and enthusiasm all combined became exponentially greater. Uh, we we now had uh, something that the world didn't know we had, and it was it became our our self-imposed obligation uh, to make people understand uh, the, the 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 promise of highly active antiretroviral therapy beyond the obvious. Uh, and I am grateful to Stephen Lewis and President Clinton, as well as Nora Volkov, uh, three key uh, giants in the field from different uh, sort of angles. Uh, who, before the science supported our work, rally behind us with the government of the Prairie of Rich Columbia, and you, and you show a clip from Kevin Falcon there, uh, and with their support, we were able to move this agenda forward all the way to the United Nations, the Vatican, WHO, and we made them basically agree that this was the way to go. Uh, and still today, I resent the fact that we're not where we were supposed to be, but it is Tico and my patients who are in the, in, in the back of my, of my mind uh, telling me every day uh, there is more that you can do and I will do it for as long as I'm alive. <laughs> That's a, well, thank you for uh, being so passionate for so many years. Obviously, it's uh, saved millions of lives. Um, so at that, I want to thank Tico Carey and Dr. Montaner for uh, your time today on the panel. And uh, I'll uh, turn it over to Leah, I believe, um, who will be coming back to say our final goodbyes. Hello, everyone. 
Wow. Well, I knew this discussion was going to be incredible, but I could never have imagined such a rich dialogue with such incredible insights from all four of you that you shared. So my, my deep gratitude uh, to the four of you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Montaner. Thank you, Tico Kerr. And thank you, Carrie Gulke, for the time, the expertise, the insights um, in the form of not just the documentary, but today, this uh, outstanding discussion. From, from TELL's perspective, we're honored that the BC Center for Excellence in HIV AIDS supported us in promoting this event. I'd also like to thank some other folks. Uh, thank you to Keith Davidson and Selena Ho on the TELUS team for helping produce this event. And finally, a very big thank you to Laura O'Grady for her outstanding work in bringing these important stories to the screen and for moderating such a great discussion today. Thank you, Laura. Soon you, the recording. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you, Laura. Soon the recording of the panel discussion will be available on channel 707 on TELUS Optic TV and on the TELUS Originals YouTube channel. Please consider subscribing to the YouTube channel to be informed when we launch new films. We'd greatly appreciate your feedback and how you enjoyed this event. So if you registered using Eventbrite, you'll receive a feedback survey by email later this week. And um, we, we, please, uh, we ask you that you please watch out for that in your inbox. Thank you again for attending today's screening and discussion, and we wish you a great evening. Take care. Thank you.